Okay, so today we're going to start talking about real policy issues. Um, in particular, we'll start with externalities. So we're going to begin by talking about what externalities are. And I bet you guys all think you know what externalities are. And I bet after, in about 45 minutes you won't think you know what externalities are. Uh, so I'm going to say that So the, what you probably think externalities are is effects that are, occur across people. When I do something and it affects someone else. And I'm going to argue that that's not at all what externalities are. That in fact, externalities are all about the failure of a price to exist for something that you do. The failure uh, to take into account the cost of a particular action. And I'm going to illustrate that by talking about um, the distinction between pecuniary and real externalities. And then talk about some other things that you might not necessarily think are externalities that might actually be externalities. Then talk about how policy responds to externalities, comparing taxes versus cap and trade versus legal liability. And I'll in particular emphasize the trade-off between price controls, uh, that is taxes, and quantity controls such, a, uh, such as cap and trade. I'll then briefly talk about Stigler's Coase theorem, um, which will highlight uh, the importance of information in determining the right policy towards externalities. Which will then, after a break, lead us to think about how we can gather the information necessary to assess externalities correctly using scientific expertise co and cost-benefit analysis, such as the statistical value of human life and the Stern report, which you were supposed to read, as well as gathering information from members of the public uh, using either contingent valuation surveys uh, or methods that try to take into account the strategic problems with contingent valuation uh, surveys, in particular the Vickery Clark Groves and expected externality mechanism. Okay, so let, let's start by asking what an externality is. Um, and uh, Oscar Quiroga, what, what, what is it, what, how would you define an externality? just intuitively before, uh, before this class. Yeah, so that's the standard definition of an externality that people think of. And most people think that an externality get, got that name because it's an effect that's external to me as a person. And in fact, we'll see that some of the names people have given to other things reflect that misunderstanding. But in fact, that is not the, um, that is not where the term externality comes from. The term externality comes from the fact that the effect is external to the price system rather than outside of myself and to someone else. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, really externalities have nothing to do with whether you're affected. They have everything to do with whether things are inside or outside of the price system. So we'll go through that. Um, okay, so um, the simple and most classical example of an externality, where these two things get very much conflated with one another, is worth going through. So imagine that we're thinking about smoking. And there are n individuals. Each individual has a utility, uj, which depends on the amount they smoke and the average amount that everyone else smokes, plus their income, ij. Um, so uh, uh, Tatiana is not here, right? Tatiana Mora? No. Um, Notice that this utility function we made quasi-linear in the income of the person. And the reason why we did that is because as we discussed in the previous class, most things like smoking don't have a big enough impact on your income that it's worth considering income effects. Now, if each, individ each individual on their own is going to set their marginal utility from smoking equal to zero, right? 
But imagine that we want to maximize total social wealth, total consumer surplus, right? Which we said is equivalent to Pareto efficiency when you don't have income effects. Then, rather than setting the, um, the marginal utility of smoking for the individual equal to zero, we have to set the marginal utility of smoking for the individual plus the average externality of increasing the average amount of smoking equals zero. Right? Um, so the reason why we have to do this is that uh, we could always redistribute income and uh, we want therefore to maximize uh, the total social welfare which is done by taking into account the effect that your smoking has on all of them. Um, so this is Pigou's principle of payment in accordance with product. People should pay the average externalities of their actions. That is, um, that's, and that principle is really not just a principle of economics, it's a principle of common sense. If I hurt someone else, I should have to pay for the harm that that causes, right? You pay for the average consequences of your actions on other people. And in fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what a market does, right? In a market, if it's working well, every time I want to do something that harms someone else, I have to purchase the right to do that. So if rather than you having this delicious meal to consume, I want to buy it, I have to pay you for the harm that it causes that you don't get the meal, the opportunity cost, which is determined by a price, right? On the other hand, anytime I give a benefit to another person, I'm compensated for that by the marginal externality that, externality that causes on someone else, right? So in, in a very important sense, market prices are exactly Pigou's principle. And all that an externality is, is when there is some cost or benefit of an action which is not incorporated into the price system. Okay, so um, Solutions to externality problems, therefore, should focus on the place where the price is missing, the place where I'm failing to be compensated or to compensate for the harms or benefits that I cause. So we shouldn't just come in and say, oh, smoking is causing some harm. Let's randomly find some people and tell them they can't smoke. Because that's not focused on the key distortion, which is the absence of the price for smoking. Instead, what we should do is have a tax on the smoking, right? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, this may seem like a pretty obvious principle, but actually lots of macroeconomics is completely in violation of this principle. So what's the standard macroeconomic prescription for when uh, the economy is in recession? It's like, go give some tax cuts or go build some projects, right? So think about how little sense that makes. It's like, imagine that someone's smoking and what you say is, I'm just gonna steal some money away from you so you have less money to buy cigarettes so you won't smoke as much. I mean, that's like so loosely related to the actual thing that you're interested in accomplishing, which is a reduction in the smoking. Similarly, when the economy is, you know, when not enough people are spending, if we think that's the problem, it's a bit crazy to say, let's just give people money and hope they spend it. Why not subsidize people's spending? That is, give them money if they spend, right? And similarly, think about what happened during all the bank rescues. We bailed out all the banks because we wanted them to provide credit to the economy, rather than providing them subsidies for giving loans. It's sort of like, it was not at all directed at the direct, you know, the direct object. So Pragu's principle says, you should always focus your actions as directly as possible on what you think is the distortion that's missing from the market. Okay, so um, this, I think, is one of the most powerful and fundamental principles in economics, but it becomes problematic when people have risks. So, Suppose that you had to pay for all the harm that was caused by your car. 
Um, if you had a terrible um, accident that killed someone, right, you'd have to pay for the cost of that other person's life by, I guess, getting killed or, or something like that, right? Um, this sort of eye for an eye justice seems a bit crazy because it's not like you meant to kill the other person, right? If what you did was unintentional and it was just that there was very, uh, you know, there was some big uncertainty about what would happen because of the way the traffic was going and so forth, um, it seems like if people are at all risk averse, that could be a very, very inefficient form of providing incentives, even though it would cause people to internalize all the consequences of their action. So um, this is the reason why we have car insurance and why we have traffic regulations, right? Ra traffic regulations are not targeted exactly at the consequences of the actions that you take, right? They're targeted at something that's likely to lead to those consequences, but you know, it's, it's somewhat uncertain. But because it would be involve too much risk to people to actually make them bear all the consequences of their actions, we instead take something that's correlated with that but has less risk, and we impose the consequences on that, and we have insurance on the outcomes, right? So um, even though Pigou's principle is a very important starting point, you have to understand that you also have to provide people with insurance or they, uh, you, know, you can have very inefficient systems. Um, a similar problem is that you, know, you can say, well, look, we're going to impose all the uh, taxes to make you pay for all the harm that you cause. But if someone goes bankrupt, at some point they can't pay, right? Unless we have slavery or something like that, right? And um, that is certainly the case for when you kill someone in your car, you almost certainly couldn't pay for the cost of their life. So then this principle of payment in accordance with product becomes impossible, and it becomes necessary to stop misbehavior by things that don't have such dramatic costs, that on average have lower costs, so you can be certain that the person can pay that rather than uh, going bankrupt. And the, this trade-off is going to show up a bunch of places in the course, especially in Lecture 9, between providing the right incentives and providing people insurance or ensuring that people are able to make the payments. Okay. Now let's go and think about what actually externalities are. Now imagine that I am walking along the street one day and I discover a giant hoard of gold that was buried somewhere, right? Gold prices are then going to fall, right? Because if it's big enough, it'll reduce world gold prices. And so other people who own gold will be worse off, right? Um, is Jaime Naranjo here? No? Does anyone else want to say whether they think this is an externality? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's getting at the right intuition. Let me try to explain it. Sorry, remind me of your name again? Pablo. Pablo, Pablo of course. Um, yeah, so that's very much getting at it. Let me try to explain it perhaps a little bit more intuitively. So it is true that the people who currently own gold are going to be worse off. But because it's mediated through the price system, there is no loss of welfare on net. In particular, the people who are buying gold are better off by exactly how much the people who are selling gold are worse off by. Those two effects perfectly balance one another, and therefore there is no externality of what you did. So, coming back to Oscar's definition, are you guys starting to see why it makes absolutely no sense to think about an externality as something that affects another person. Because all the time we do stuff that affects other people. But it affects them in a way that just redistributes from one group to the other, rather than impacting one group in a way that doesn't affect anyone else. Yeah, Danielle. No, it doesn't, because when you change the price by the envelope theorem, 
the change in welfare of one side is equal to the quantity times the change in price, and the change in welfare of the other side is equal to the quantity times the change in price. And those things exactly offset each other. So any change in prices has zero effect on welfare. Okay, so this effect is called a pecuniary externality. That is, it's not an externality at all. But, but because people have this misunderstanding of what an externality is and think that an externality is when you affect someone else rather than something that's missing from the price system, people have labeled these things that are not actually externalities as pecuniary externalities. Okay, now almost all of the misapplications of the theories of externalities, and you'll see these all over the place by very prominent economists, come from misunderstanding the distinction between pecuniary and real externalities. So I'm gonna to try to go through a bunch of examples to try to train you guys out of the wrong way of thinking about externalities. Okay, so um, one example of this is people would often say, oh, competition creates an externality on the other firms in the market, right? Well, um, that's true. Well, so let, let, let's ask whether that's true. So Anna, do you think that that's really uh, a true externality? Well, let, let's try to break it down a little bit more. What if I come into the market, I'm competing with you, you're making some profits on every sale that you do, and I come in and I don't actually lower the prices at all, but I just steal some sales away from you. Would that be a real externality or would that be a pecuniary externality? Um, yeah. Exactly, exactly right. On the other hand, if in, as in Anna's original example, the price had fallen, but I hadn't actually taken any sales away from the other guy, then it's a purely pecuniary externality. So the key question, and we'll come back to this over and over again when we talk about oligopoly and monopoly, when, when you think about market power problems, this is the key principle. Almost everything that you learn about, all this complicated stuff about oligopoly theory, comes down to the question of whether you are taking profitable sales away from the other guy or whether you're just causing the prices to fall. If you're just causing the prices to fall, that is not an externality. But if you take sales away from the other guy, that is an externality. Okay, another example is suppose that free trade with China causes steel workers to lose their job. Is that a real or a pecuniary externality? Well, it should be a pecuniary externality because what does it mean for the workers to lose their jo job? It means that the wages that people were willing to pay for them to do the work in that industry fell. That means that the workers will have to go work somewhere else. Now that's bad for those workers, but it's good for the companies that might hire them. Right? And so whatever harm it causes to the workers is offset by a benefit from the companies that then hire them. Yeah, Pablo. There's either a link of markets that are just affected by the disease. Is it always the case that they're always going to be like hub? Because I guess sometimes like there is like something real externality that's Well, if there's market power that can occur, right? But if there's no market power that can occur. Because if there's no market power, then we always have the envelope theorem holding, and it's always delta P times Q is the welfare change, right? As Anna was pointing out, the only time you get a bad effect is when you're taking away profitable sales that the person has. And the only time sales are profitable is if you're not charging prices equal to the marginal cost, right? So the, it, to the extent that it does hurt the workers and is a real externality, it's because the work, there's monopsony power or mono, oligopsony power or monopoly power on the part of a union that's being affected, right? Um, imagine that I pollute the lake and this harms the consumers of fish because now 
uh, the price of fish is going to be higher. Is that a real or a pecuniary externality? Anyone want to? What? That's pecuniary because the people who sell fish at other places benefit by exactly the amount that the, that the consumers are harmed. But then who is the victim of the real externality of polluting in the lake? Who? What? No? Exactamente. La persona que tiene el derecho de uh, pes pescador en, en este uh, lake, right? It's the, it's the person who has the right over the fish. Now, that might not be the fishers. Imagine that someone owns the right to the fish in the lake and just hires fishers. Fishers wouldn't, be har wouldn't have a real externality here. It's the person who owns the right to the fish which is destroyed by the pollution. Right? Um, imagine that, yeah, go ahead. No, no, because they, all the, ben the harms to them are offset by the benefits to the people who sell other fish because the price is adjusted. You know, that's purely mediated through the price system, the harms on consumers. Another example of this is imagine that a brilliant roommate of yours gets stoned and does really badly on the exam. And that helps you beat the curve, right? Well, that benefits you, but it harms sort of like your future employers or your professor or whoever it is that is benefiting from having the price, you know, performance be higher for a given value of the grades. So again, that doesn't sound like a price exactly, but it basically is. It's the market price of a given grade, right? is changing, and that's what's giving you the benefit, not an actual change in the performance. So his getting stoned doesn't actually give a positive externality on you. Another example of this is that um, in a lot of East Asian countries, there's selective abortion of women. And what that means is that there's many, many, many more men than there are women in these countries. So for example, in China, the sex ratio is almost two to one now among certain age cohorts. And you might think, hey, actually, that's good for all the women who do end up getting born because they get all these great men, right? But it harms the men exactly as much as it benefits the women. So again, that's not a price, but it's one of these things that, as I said before, acts like a price. It's a, it's a market-like mechanism. And so there isn't a real externality of those selective abortions, at least along that dimension. Okay. Now, this distinction shows up a lot in the law. And I'm sorry if it will bore you to go through stuff that shows up in the law system of the United States, because I'm not sure whether it shows up in the law legal system of Columbia, but, but at least maybe it's of some interest. So there's something called physical damages. Physical damages means I hit a doctor with a car or I burned down his house. I owe him the damages of you know, the hurt that I caused him or the hurt that I caused to his house. Or if I defame someone and uh, you know, cause a libel on their character, that destroys their reputation, that's a, a harm to them. So these are direct, even if not literally physical harms, and they, they call, get called physical harms. There's a second category, which is called pure economic losses. So for example, patient, if you hit a doctor with the car, and now his patients no longer have a doctor, that's considered a pure economic loss, not a physical damage. Or if, some, if you burn down the doctor's house and now house prices in the neighborhood go up because there's less housing available, that's also considered a pure economic uh, gain. Um, on the other hand, how about if the other people in the neighborhood were benefiting from the fact that um, that house was actually uh, making the neighborhood more beautiful of a place to live in. And so when it gets burned down, the prices of the houses in the neighborhood go down. Would that be an externality, a real externality or not? Does anyone want to guess? Why? But, but why is that, unlike the effect through the market prices, uh, a real externality. Because there's no compensation. There's no, there's no one else gaining from that. Or perhaps, the, perhaps someone is. 
You're, you're getting closer. So that's no, that's it. It, it is a real externality. Does anyone else want to keep trying to explain why? Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to try, Nancy? Yeah. So that's that's getting closer. Anyone else? So the basic difference here is that that person wasn't getting compensated for the fact that his house was increasing the value of everyone else in the neighborhood. If that person had been getting a payment every month for how much he was increasing the value of the houses in the neighborhood, then all the harm would accrue to him because it would be the destruction of his, the money he was getting plus the destruction of the value of the house to him. All that would be in the value of the house. But because he wasn't, he was creating a positive externality. Now that positive externality has been destroyed. That effect is not mediated through the price system. And therefore, it is a real externality. Okay. So, this became a really major issue during the, um, the uh, Deepwater Horizon crisis. Does anyone remember what that was? There was, in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a big oil tanker, a big oil rig that basically hit the wrong spot in the sea and suddenly all this oil started coming up into the sea and caused all sorts of problems. And there was giant lawsuits trying to get money for all the harms caused by this. And the courts had a very difficult time trying to distinguish what things were physical damages and what things were pure economic losses. And I hope that after this class, you guys could be great consultants trying to persuade them one way or the other on different effects. So let's try to go through some examples. Do you think that there was a real economic, a real externality or a, a physical damage caused to the shrimping employees who lost their jobs as a result of this pollution which made it so that you couldn't fish? Uh, is Elio Sanabria here? Elio, no? Sanabria, no? Okay. Uh, anyone else want to guess? Yeah, go ahead, Pablo. So, so you're saying that the shrimping employees don't? No. Yes. Well, yeah, that's right, because the shrimping employees are uh, going to find work somewhere else at a lower wage. It benefits the people who hire them and harms them, right? How about a government conservation agency that has the responsibility of protecting birds that are now being killed by this, uh, by this effect? by the uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster. Jaime, is Jaime Naranjo here? Anyone else want to try? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so that, that's right. So I think the basic logic is that this government agency, in some sense, has the property rights over those birds. Right? Everyone in society gets some diffuse benefit from having these birds around. These government agents are put in charge of being the guardians of that public good. Right? And so maybe it doesn't directly accrue to them, but they are sort of the representatives of the little bit to which it accrues to everyone else in society. Right? And there's no compensation for that. That's a direct harm, the destruction of those birds. How about the Louisiana hotel industry, so, which was serving for people who came down to do stuff related to fishing? So imagine there were some hotels. And what, they, what people used to do there was to come down and stay at those hotels while they were doing business related to fishing. And now that there's no more fishing, there's no more business. Uh, who, uh, does anyone want to try to explain whether that's a real externality on those hotels or not? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, or actually the people who are buying the hotel services are better off because the price that the hotels are going to have to charge to fill up is going to be lower, right? And so the, you know, it's true that there will be, there's less demand, and so the price will fall, but in, in equilibrium, the hotel will end up selling out as well, uh, or maybe they'll sell the hotel, but the person who buys the hotel will benefit then. You, you see what I'm saying? So there will always be someone on the other side of that transaction. Now, what about uh, disrupted shippers through the ports that can no longer ship through the ports because it's so clogged with oil. Sebastian, can you, uh, what, do, what do you think? So imagine that there's a port and there's a bunch of people who ship through the port and the port, it now becomes very hard to go to that port. Do you, do you think that'll cause a real or a pecuniary externality? So, I so there's I I, I think that there's, that's partly true. Does anyone want to add more on to that? Well, he, here's a way to think about it. If the port is charging people the full value of shipping through that port, then you're right. There's no externality because what will just happen is that rate that they're charging will come down, right? Until people are still willing to ship, ship through the port even though it's more costly to do so. However, and therefore the real externality will be on the owner of the port concession. But instead imagine that the port is operated as a public good and it's free to ship through the port. And so there's all these people that are gaining benefits from having the right to ship through the port. Well then, the people who are shipping, th their prices won't change at all because they were paying zero before. And in that case, it would be a real externality. So it all depends on whether you were paying a market price for the service that's now been destroyed. Okay. Um, So, what that tells us is not even close to everything that happens across people is a real externality. I want to now try to uh, convince you that not everything that happens within a person is fine and efficient. That in fact there can be lots of externalities within a person, which sounds even crazier, right? So individuals often neglect or ignore or impose costs on their future selves. Um, and these are often called internalities, and the policy towards them is called paternalism. But as I think you guys probably have learned by now, it's kind of silly that it's called an internality. Because externality has nothing to do with the fact that it has an effect on another person. It has to do with the fact that it's not taken into account in the decisions that people make, right? So this is basically the same idea uh, as a market. Within a person, I may not take into account all the effects that I have on myself. And there's large areas of policy that are in fact driven by exactly this type of consideration. So Pablo, what do you think are some of the examples of policies that are very common all over the world that are driven by what is usually called internalities? So these are things where I fail to in take into account the effect that I have on my own welfare or the welfare of my future self? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but you can think of other things, I think, which are even bigger areas of policy where this is a huge determinant of what happens. Things very important in Colombia, for example. Drug control, right? Mo I mean, drug control, is so there's some issues about affecting other people. But I think a huge fact is we think drugs are bad for people and that people don't fully take that into account because of addiction or 
something that's wrong with their psychology, um, and therefore we don't allow them to use drugs. So um, there's all sorts of syntaxes, prohibitions on drugs that are based on these principles. We often force people to save through the social security system because we don't think people save enough. Um, we have in the United States, I don't know if you have in Colombia, minimum standards in terms of how energy efficient vehicles will be. And from a perspective of climate change, you would just say we should put a tax on carbon. But um, if people are making systematically the wrong decisions about what types of cars to buy, because they don't take into account the fact that you know, if they buy a bigger car, they're going to have to pay more for gas, it might actually be in those people's own interest to force them to buy more efficient cars. And I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Um, but there's tons of other areas where this is true. For example, prohibitions on slavery. Why do we not let people sell themselves into slavery? Well, probably because we think that if they do, you know, that they are making a short-term decision that's going to have long-run impact on their lives, we don't think they should be able to do that. We don't think they should be able to have such negative effects on their future selves. When you think about organ donations, why don't we allow people to donate their organs? Well, probably because we don't want them to make a snap decision uh, you know, for money. Why don't we allow them to sell their organs? Uh, we don't want them to make a snap decision that will affect the rest of their lives. We don't allow people to commit suicide because they're not allowed to cause such harm to their future selves just because they're feeling a certain way now. Right? So tons of areas of policy in society are motivated by externalities that are within a person rather than across people. So here's the example from Alcott and Wozni's paper. So what they um, basically found is that um, so they looked at when gas prices increased, how much people changed their purchases of different types of cars. And um, there's a certain amount that you should change your purchases of different types of cars if you're fully taking into account the effect that gas prices have on the discounted net present value of owning that car. And that's given by this red line here. But in fact, what, the, what they found empirically is people's changes were more like this. So people only took into account about 75% of the impact that an increase in gas prices had on uh, how much they should have changed their consumption of cars. OK. So another difficulty for externalities uh, comes when we take into account people who are not yet alive. So let me give you a, an example of that. So this problem comes from Derek Parfit, who is probably the mo one of the most interesting uh, utilitarian philosophers in the world. So he said, um, imagine that you're thinking about having a child. And imagine that on net there's zero externalities of that to everyone else living. There will be benefits of you know, innovation that they'll bring or whatever. There will be costs from increased crowding, but on net it's zero. And imagine that you know that your child would have a good, happy life. Um, the question is, is there an inefficiency here to be corrected? Uh, Gabrielle, do you think that there's an inefficiency here to be corrected? That is, should there be a subsidy or a tax on having a child in this situation? Does anyone else have, have opinions? Pablo, yeah? It depends on how the rest of the people are affected by tax. No, but I said that's all ne on net zero. So no. Anyone else? Anyone disagree? OK, so you're, you're thinking about having a child, or, or, or people are thinking about having child, children. There's zero net externality on anyone who's currently living of having a new child. But you know that your child, if you bear that child, will have a happy life. Is there an inefficiency to be corrected? Sebastian. What, excuse me? What did you say that? Is there an inefficiency to be corrected? That is, should there be a subsidy or a tax on having the child? What do you think? I think it depends. What, what, Gabrielle? What?
That is, there's a benefit to the child. What, what's the benefit? To the child, who's not yet born. No, well, no, forget about that for the parent, but the parents take that into account. That, that's, they're, they're taking that into account. What, what do you think, Sebastian? Well, that's, that's exactly the question. That is the key question, right? Is there an externality on the child? Does that even make sense to think about? Can you say that there's an externality? Is the child willing to pay to be born? The child doesn't even exist yet. You're bringing this child into the world. Would this child be willing to... So imagine we had the following arrangement. We pay you $5,000, and then you get to take $5,000 away from your kid once he's born. Would that be efficiency enhancing? I mean, the child will still live a pretty happy life. He'll just be $5,000 poorer. Would he be willing to have a $5,000 poorer life and be alive rather than not be alive? So this is a hard problem. <laughs> I don't think anyone has a good answer to this problem. But it's a, fu it's a fundamental problem that shows up in a lot of areas because we have to think there's many areas where decisions we make affect how many people are born. And we need to think about what's the value of new people being born. Or to give you another really difficult example of this, imagine that I, have a, I, I use contraception uh, and try to choose which child I'm going to have. And I choose to have a child that uh, doesn't have Down syndrome rather than one that does, if I can get genetic testing. Uh, is that a benefit to the child or not? Well, it's a little hard to say because you denied one child the right to have come into existence and had another child come into existence. So there's two different individuals there. How do we compare their welfare? I don't know. Okay, so let, let me go through another series of examples that will get you to try to think about these types of things. So um, imagine that you drive drunk, you get drunk and you drive on the road. Um, and imagine there's no laws against this, so you're not going to get fined or whatever. Does this create an externality on other people who are in the car with you? Uh, does anyone want to try to address that? Sorry, remind me of your name? Oscar. Oscar, Oscar what, what's... Serrano. Serrano, okay. The ones who are driving in the car with you. What, what do you think, Danielle? Why? Because if he crushes somebody else, he would just pay. Anyone else want to keep going? Yeah. Juan, go ahead. I'd say there are two scenarios. First of all, because the person is getting in somewhere, and he's, he's not paying for that. I mean, he could have paid for the bus or for the taxi or something like that. And the other side, there's a risk of his life. So Okay, instead of keep going on, let's take a vote. How many people think that there is a real external, uh, there's an externality there? Raise your hand if you think there's an externality there. How many people think that there isn't an externality there? And how many people think it depends on details of the situation yet to be set specified? <laughs> okay, let's keep going and let's come back to this. Okay. How about, is there an externality to other people on the road that night when you drive drunk? Uh, Pablo, what do you think about that? Yes, people see water, but the risk is increasing and there's no gaining anything. Yeah, everyone else is more likely to die. Yeah. D d who, who thinks that that's a real externality? Raise your hand. Who thinks that it's not an externality? I have a question. Like, in the right moment, there's no problem, not a lot of society because nothing is happening. Unless he's very drunk, he could get to home safe. I'm thinking on average, let's say the expected externality. Yeah. Nothing is happening, right? 
Okay, so everyone seems to think there's an externality there. Now, let's think about this. Why, why do people have such different views between these two things? The people who are in the car with you are just on the road, right, as well. I mean, they're the, right? Well, they chose to be there. Well, does that matter? The people who are on the road chose to be on the road, too. They went driving on the road. I mean, they chose to be on the road, right? I mean... Well, that doesn't matter. I mean, that, that's irrelevant to whether it's an externality, right? I mean, they know there must be somebody out there who's drunk on the road. Just the laws of probability will tell them that. What if you're, the people who got into the car with you didn't know for sure that you were drunk? I mean, it would, it, would that change whether it's an externality that you got drunk? I don't I think that would make it even worse, right? Okay, so uh, here's my view on all this. So... Um, I don't know who it was, I think it was maybe Pablo, or maybe Juan, he said that these people weren't paying for the transportation services they were getting. So that is an interesting question. So if I get into a car with you and I'm a drunk driver, do I pay for the costs that are imposed by me being drunk? Well, it depends on what our relationship is like. Why am I giving you a ride? It probably was you're my friend. What do I expect from being your friend? All sorts of friend services in the future. If the fact that I'm drunk, or if I cause, end up causing an accident for you, is going to make my life as much worse off as it makes your life as a result of, of me driving drunk, then there is no externality. Or if you're paying me and you reduce the amount you pay me because now I'm giving you a less good ride, then yes, that, that internalizes everything and there's no real externality of me driving drunk. On the other hand, if I'm giving you this benefit for free and you're not going to compensate me based on the quality of the ride in terms of the future services you give me as a friend, as favors and so forth, then, uh, then there is a real externality of this ingredient. And what about all the other people on the road? Well, the thing is, I, it probably is a real externality because I'm not taking into account all of the harms that I'm causing to the other people because they're not going to pay me back in any way for it. So the key question is, is there a price? That's the key point I'm trying to get home to you guys. The only thing you need to ask in figuring out whether something's externality is, is there a price? It doesn't have to be a money price. It doesn't have to, but is there some way in which I pay for the consequences of my actions? Okay. Um, Is there an externality on yourself? What do you think, Nancy? What? What do you think, Pablo? Yeah, so I mean, if you're in a state where you're not fully taking into account the consequences of getting drunk, then there is an internality on yourself, right? But if you're in a state where you're fully taking into account the consequences for your future self of that, then there isn't an externality. How about, is there an externality on your family and those who depend on you? What do you think, Juan? Um, well, it, it depends a bit on whether you have insurance, right? Uh, it depends a lot on whether you have insurance. But if you have insurance, then there's an externality on the people who gave insurance. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, it also depends on whether your family gets pissed off at, enough at you that it makes your life bad enough that, they, that you got drunk, right? Because if they do, then that could compensate for the benefits, right? Did, did you have something coming in? Well, is the insurance a price for risk that you Well, it's, uh, I, I think actually Juan's answer is right, is that the insurance passes it along to the insurance company. It just changes who, who bears the externality. But, but is, is it a price? 
No, it's not because it's not a price on the decision that you made. It's a price for the risk that was given before the decision that you made occurred. But conditional on that, you know, moral hazard affects the you know, value to the insurer. It's not a price that you pay in order to take that moral hazard. The insurance is a price on the risk holding fix the actions. And the, yeah, Oscar. Is that like you have a insurance and you never have to use it? Would that be like taking externality? If I have an insurance and I never have to use it, would that be an externality? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a positive externality on the insurance company, right? Because you, you're choosing to be careful enough. If you take an action that causes you not to have to use it. Yeah, go ahead. They are not going to use that money to pay to another guy who actually used the, I mean, the, the insurance company. So they are, it's supposed that they are not going to. Yeah, but you're giving the money to the insurance company. That's a benefit to them, right? Okay. So. How about, is there an externality on the potential children that you might have in the future, but don't currently have? Juan, what, Juan Rojas, what do you think of that? Yeah. Yeah. It depends on your answer to this question up here, right? If your answer to this question is here, yes, there is an externality on the child, but we don't have subsidies, then that's a problem. But if we do have a subsidy for having children that's equal to the externality that you decide that it has on the future child, then there is no externality here because you're giving up a flow of money in the future by killing yourself, which presumably you take into account, unless you don't, in which case it's an externality on yourself, right? Um, Okay, um, to make things even more uh, confusing, maybe you guys were skeptical of the notion you could have an externality on your future self. I don't know if you were. But, but if you were, think about how different is your unborn child from your future self, really? Because in some sense, you know, myself in 50 years is much further away from me right now than my child who might be born in a year is. Myself in 50 years, I mean, I could be all sorts of things that I would hate. So if you guys don't uh, believe that, you should read, you should watch the movie Memento. It's a very interesting movie. This is about someone who has no long-term memory. And so as soon as something gets out of their mind, or no short-term memory. So as soon as something gets out of their mind, they, they're just a new person, right? So what responsibility would such a person feel to their future self, right? How is our future self so different from someone who's standing next to us? Anyways, these are just all things to reflect on uh, and to uh, and to think about. Okay. Now, um, why don't we take a five-minute break here? <laughs>